there's anyone here. I guess not. Orville is off to who knows where. Our mysterious host seems to be away as well. I guess I'll have to find out what I came here for on my own. All right, let's get to work. It's just unbelievable how much better television used to be. Sure, there wasn't any color. The picture was square. The clarity left something to be desired. But I'd trade all of those things in exchange for a good story. No smut, limited violence, and no cursing. Not to mention the one thing that really gets my goat, taking the Lord's name in vain. How often have I had to sit through that one act alone and pretend like nothing has happened at all, all in the name of civility, when all the while what I should have been doing is getting up and whopping everyone present over the head with the remote for allowing such vile filth into the house. I deserve a good whack myself, now that I think about it. Television, the internet, man... Even just walking down the street to the Dairy Dream, one gets an education about human anatomy. I thought clothes were supposed to cover up what one has, not pointed out. Good evening, Bunsen. You sure are here late tonight? Hiya, Mary. Yeah, a dual feature for this show. So I just got to make sure there ain't nothing objectionable to the eyes of a five-year-old. Or their parents, for that matter. So, I was just taking my time, sitting up here combing through the archives, talking to myself, like I usually is when I does this. You really should see if one of your friends would come up here with you to keep you company while you do this. Surely one of them would find this sort of work interesting, wouldn't they? Ah, uh, sure they would. But, well, this is kind of my assignment. I was agreed to do it, and it's all on me. So I has got to do it on my own. Succeed or fail, right or wrong, good or bad. Whatever comes of it, it's on my head. But it ain't so bad. When I has get into an argument with myself, I has always comes out the winner. That's what I like about you, Bunsen. You've got a great sense of humor. One has to with a task like this. It's the only way to survive the tedium. What movies are you looking at right now? Well, not really movies. One's a TV show from the 1950s about Pontius Pilate. The other one is, well, I was not sure. I guess you'd call it a classroom film from the 1940s. Or maybe a church film. Or a combination of the two. It's about how Jesus is the door to heaven. I think I remember a little about Pilate from my days in Sunday school. But that was a long time ago. All I can remember about him was that he didn't really want to send Jesus to his death, but his hand was forced. Is that about right, Bunsen? In a nutshell, yeah. He was in a rough spot, all right, Mary. If you'd like a refresher course on the story of Pontius Pilate, you're welcome to preview this episode of Studio One with me. I'd sure appreciate the company. I was hoping you'd ask, Bunsen. Me, me and Baby finished up work and didn't feel like going home. I heard you talking in here and, well, last time was so much fun. Don't mention it, Mary. Like I said, you and Baby are always welcome here to watch these movies 
and shows with me. By the way, how's baby Ben since I last saw you? How have you been doing? Baby and I have been doing fine, Bunsen. We laugh and talk and play when we get time at the end of each day. Those are the best moments, but they are far too short. Before we know it, Baby and I have fallen asleep exhausted, and the alarm is ringing once more. It's time to get up and begin anew. Time to drop Baby off at the children's center. Time for me to get back to the grace pit, knowing that after 12 short hours I'll be with Baby again. That makes the hours more manageable. When I can, I get up to the children's center on my lunch break to peek in on Baby and see how he's doing. But I'm such a mess, I don't dare enter. I fear I might frighten the poor little guy, not to mention all the other children, too. So I watch from afar and dream of our time together at the end of the day. Then it's back to the grease pit to finish out my shift. It's a life, Bunsen. It's a life. Mara, don't get me wrong, but you're no ordinary cleaning woman. I mean, even if you use cleaning engines, you use no ordinary cleaning cleaner either. You're too, I don't know, but you're too something to be cleaning engines. You're, you seem so educated, at least to me. How you end up cleaning engines? How do you end up here? My story isn't an uncommon one, Bunsen. Like many young girls, I married far too early, but you couldn't dissuade me. At 16, I knew that I was a woman and I was ready to take on the world. Like most 16-year-olds, I didn't think I could lose. For a while, I didn't. I married right away to a wonderful man who did well for himself. He did well for us. As I told you, no children came along, so I lived the life of a housewife, taking care of her husband, making beds, fixing meals, cleaning floors, doing laundry. The entire domestic deal was my life. Until a child came along that was fine by me. It was all I wanted. A year passed, then another year passed. Then another year passed. Suddenly I was 19 years old, Bunsen, without an education, without a child, without with a husband that was out of the house all day every day and who only came home to sleep. I was alone, alone a lot of the time, all alone. So very alone. Something I'd come to be used to later in life, I guess. But then at that young age, well, with so much time on my hands, without a baby to care for, the household routine eventually became so routine it didn't take long to do. One can only watch so much television or listen to so much music. So one day I opened up my husband's books. He didn't have many, just technical manuals on interstellar engines, so I read them. I didn't understand a word in them, but I read them over and over and over and over again until eventually I had them memorized. Even though I had them memorized, didn't, I didn't know what any of the stuff in them really meant or how to apply any of it. Hey, I knew a lot about interstellar engines anyway. What happened then, Mary? When I was 21, my husband died in a job-related accident. That was, what, wow, 21 years ago now. I've lived my life over again since then. Anyway, there wasn't much of an insurance policy for workers in that job. There was one, but... It didn't cover all that much. Just the funeral cost and, well, a little to live off afterward for a while. But there I was, 21 years old. No education, a widow, and on my own. I took whatever work I could get. Since I did know a little about engines, I put in for work on passenger ships. I figured, why not? If one broke down, maybe someday something I read would come in handy, and it would serve me well. At the very least, it would get me away from my home and all the memories and give me a chance at a fresh start somewhere else. I got a job as an entry-level cleaning woman, making beds, cleaning floors, doing laundry. So much for getting away from memories, starting anew. How Bunsen? But hey, it was a step in the right direction at least. And, well, as time went on, 
My employers did overhear me talking to my fellow co-workers about engines. And all that I learned from my husband's books. So they eventually put me in the grease pit, where I am now. One ship after another, after another. For someone without a formal education, without a degree, it's about the highest paying job you can get on these passenger liners. Especially as a woman. It's rare that a woman even makes it into the grease pit. But as a woman, as we're smaller than men, we can get into parts of the engine that men can't. So having one woman on the team is prudent. Prudent, huh? Well, Mara, I think your employer's got one heck of a workwoman, and at a bargain price, too. Have you ever thought about going back to school? Oh, yeah, sure. But really, I'm too old for such things now, Bunsen. By the time I'd finish, what would I be, pushing 50? Who'd hire me? With all those bright and shining young men sprouting from the universities, who'd want an old grease monkey well past her prime? Besides, even if I did go back to school, who'd pay for it? I'm barely making enough now to support baby and I. I could never pay for classes. No, sometimes we are who we are, and we have to be content with it. We do the best we can with what we have, and find what happiness we can within ourselves. That which comes along later comes, and... But for some of us, Bunsen, life doesn't offer many chances for improvement or happiness. We just kind of get by with what we've been able to manage, with scrapping together as the years have passed us by. It's all right, though. Money is nice, but it doesn't buy happiness. Not the kind that really matters. Anyway, enough about me. What's this show about? You said something about Pilot. Kinda sort of mare. Pilot is the center of the story. He's what it's focused around. But the story takes place during the time of Jesus' crucifixion. The story itself leans more towards being about the crucifixion's effect on Pilate's wife. She doesn't play a big part in the bulk of the story, but wow, does she ever take a part in the end. She ends up having a choice to make, and it's a choice that every Christian has to make at some point in their lives. I don't want to give away too much, because I want you to see this for yourself, Mary. All right, Bunsen, I'm ready when you are. Computer, Cube Studio One, Pontius Pilate. And play when ready. This is a cross. To most of us, it is a symbol of infinite love and infinite humility. To some, it is a symbol of infinite suffering. 1900 years ago, the cross meant something very different. It was a symbol of the power of Rome. It was a Roman instrument of execution and torture for criminals and for subject peoples. The Jews were one of these peoples. Their own laws forbade the use of the cross, but that did not stop its use against them under the overlordship of Rome. And so one day, one among them was taken by Roman guards to the crest of a hill, where by orders of Rome he was nailed to such a cross. 
It was a season of the Passover in the Roman year 783. And on that day, a certain man was brought to trial before Pontius Pilate. Yes. But why? The man's a Galilean. And since his crimes were not against the rule of Rome, there was no cause to hold him any longer. But if he were innocent, why was he not set free? The decision was not easy, my lady. The man appeared completely indifferent to the outcome of the trial. Why have they turned against him? They followed him in droves into the city. Why are they howling like that now? There's some fatality to all of us in this trial. Alice, please, we are not disturbed. The high priest requested audience. I've said I will see him. Yes, my lord. Have you turned the man over to Herod? Yes. Why? For more to gain time than anything else. I have little faith in Herod's willingness to bear the burden. He'll slither out of it. In time, it'll give me a chance to think what I should do. And is it so hard to decide? The man is a mystery. He will not struggle against events, not even against death. I could save him even now if he'd make the slightest effort at cooperation. Does he still insist that he is the rightful king? I said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, you say I am. And then he added that his kingdom was not of this world, that he came to fulfill the law of his father, whatever that may mean. He's a mystic. He's made the people believe that he's fighting for a new idea, for the truth. My dear, do you suppose for one moment that that mob of malcontents and beggars that follow him are even remotely interested in the truth? What they would like to do is to storm this palace, string Herod and me up by the neck, and put up some crazy revolutionary government of their own. Oh, Pontius, how little you understand these people, least of all him. Why, he's no more capable of starting a revolution than I am. Perhaps. A high priest is here, Your Excellency. Do not send me away. Allow me to stay. I would wish you to stay. Good morning, Your Excellency. I hope you do not object to my having brought my father-in-law with me. It never occurred to me that you would not, Caiaphas. My lady... Caiaphas? Annas? You made your request for audience most urgent. The matter is most urgent, Your Excellency. The releasing of this man to Herod uh, destroys the entire purpose of our bringing him to you. Oh, but Herod is ruler of Galilee. It is proper that he should deal with this case, I should think. This man is no local problem, Your Excellency. He is quite as great a threat to Rome as to us. In short, you desire his death. But as your laws do not permit you to uh, inflict the extreme penalty, you wish me to shoulder the burden in the name of Rome. If, uh, if we could discuss this matter in private... My, wi uh, my wife has followed the career of this man quite closely. I've asked her to stay. I trust this does not mean that you are in sympathy with this rebellion, my lady. Rebellion nonsense. He's no more than a simple teacher, a reformer. I have heard this man, and I say that what he preaches is blasphemy. Perhaps you do not understand what that means to us, my lady. I understand very well. I am half Jewish myself, you then may remember. You should well know what it means to be a subject people. We are no more than a province of a Roman province. One thing only we have, which no mad impostor, no blasphemer can take from us. The laws of our people, the covenant. We are the guardians of those laws. It is our yeah. duty. By what presumption do you dare come say these things to me? For all your robes and panoply of office, you are not even good Jews, nor rightful representatives of your people's faith because you've sold yourselves to Rome. You come here to demand the death of one of your people. I represent the law. Tell me, by what law does he deserve to die? He plots the overthrow of Rome. Did we not send you countless witnesses to attest this fact? Witnesses? You think I'm a blind fool that you send such people to my court? They lied so crudely, 
Each denied the other as soon as he could open his mouth. There is no sentence of death permitted unless the accused man be guilty of treason to Rome. This you know. I'd hear to it or this audience is at an end. Has he not publicly affirmed that he is king of the Jews? And is this not an open admission of rebellion? He is priest of Anubis. When I looked at him in the courtroom, I saw black wings hovering above him. There is a terrible evil in his silences. These are things you've built up in your own mind. I have heard him speak many times, and always with the utmost calm and gentleness. You, a Jewess, defend this man. Because I am a Jewess, I defend justice. Every man who is accused has a right to be defended. During your governorship, we have many times been faced with revolts identical to this. You've never before hesitated to execute their leaders. Yes. I have spilled more blood of your countrymen than I care to remember, and always to your applause. But during my eight years here, I've learned many things. Not again will you persuade me by false reports or coerce me to passing false sentence for you to get a tighter hold on the coppers of the temple. This I had not expected, Your Excellency. You compel me to believe that you have some personal interest in this man. Could there be in this rebellion something of advantage to you? Do you dare to suggest, Annas, that this Nazarene is in the pay of Rome? What can I think when you so impugn our motives in your own behalf? Herod Antipas, Petrarch of Galilee, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, my lady. Huh. The birds of Ilomin gather the prospect of a death sentence. I suspect that for once we may count you on our side, Hera. Uh, with some shame, I admit it. Expediency has driven me into your camp. Uh, we need none of us pretend that we have the good of our people at heart. This I deny. Our national heritage, the covenant itself, is threatened. Uh, there's no need to sound so noble. We are quite aware that this man represents a threat to all of us. If he proves to be the Messiah, your powers will be considerably curtailed. If he's the hereditary king, I lose my throne. And if the people rise and join him, as seems most likely, it will lead to a revolutionary war with Rome. Had you overlooked that possibility, Pilate, when you sent the man to me? Does this mean that you refuse responsibility of one of your own subjects? We are all subject to the overlordship of Rome. I resent that sufficiently to admit that had the man shown evidence of being the true messiah, I might quite possibly have espoused his cause. Since he did not, I return him as a matter of precaution to you. Waste no more time on legalities, pilot. Crucify the man now and get it over. I have no intention of providing you with a martyr, Herod. I warn you, pilot, unless this man is sentenced, it will go ill with you, both in Judea and in Rome. Whatever complaint you care to make to the emperor will not affect the outcome of this trial. Good day. Do not let stubbornness rule you, Your Excellency. This Nazarene is too dangerous to live. The unknown is always dangerous to you as well as to us. Old moth-eaten scavengers. They have their claws on this country like hawks on a dying mouse. To every decent Jew, they do grave harm. What do you want with me now, Herod? You sent this man back for me to judge. What more have we to discuss? You're taking it very calmly, Pilot. Very calmly indeed, considering your position. I'm not aware that my position has changed in any way. Hmm. Look at that crowd out there. How many would you say there were? 10,000? 10,000. And you have only 100 soldiers. I have been threatened enough for one day. Have you ever seen how a rebellion starts? Out of those 10,000, there are perhaps 50 men who are there with a definite purpose. Some of them are in Annas's hand and pay, and the others in mine. So what happened? One of those 50 men throws a stone, it hits one of the guard. To defend himself, the man whacks one of the bystanders over the head with his sword. Others come to the man's defense. Suddenly, a lust to destroy sweeps over those people. They After eight years of ruling in Judea, I do not need you to give me a primer course in mob psychology. Uh, all I am trying to make you understand, my dear pilot, is that those 50 men are only waiting for the signal. A signal that both you and I know you will never dare to give. You underestimate me, Pilot. I have been waiting for a long time for an opportunity like this. One thing is certain. 
If I strike for myself now, you will fall. If I fail, we shall fall together. And if I fall, another governor will be sent to take my place. My personal career is of no consequence whatsoever. Isn't it? You already lasted eight years. Another two years and it'll all be over. You will return to Rome in triumph, with adulation and a bright career before you. But one serious disturbance now, and all that will be wasted. In disgust, you will be recalled to Rome like so many were others before you. Or worse still, transferred to some barren outpost of empire to live out the bitter years, neglected and ignored. This is your moment, right? <laughs> A crowd is a wonderful thing, a terrible thing. The weapon of power, the anvil of the mighty. Forgive me, Your Excellency, but the court is assembled. Have the prisoner brought back. What makes a king, Tyler? He's not in a throne, not in an army. Not even in a crowd. I have hated you for eight years. There is nothing in the world more uninspiring than a government official. Except the king, who had not the courage to be a king. I might find the courage. Yes. But quite suddenly, I might find it. Do not listen to him. It's only words, empty threats. Yes. We might be just mad enough to try it. Oh, my head is spitting. Lie down. Rest for a moment. The court can wait. How does that feel? I wish Head Herod had not mentioned those two years. Oh, well, he was but trying to frighten you. Yes, there was a lot of truth in what he said. I am ambitious. I've dreamt of our return home of the honor we shall receive, and of the little house we shall build on the slopes outside of Rome. The house with the white pillars. I've seen it so often in my mind. I know every inch of it. So do I. And also what he threatened is true. That man represents a storm that could at any moment burst over us. In all this clamor, there are only two men who count. You and Jesus of Nazareth. It is between you two. Tell me, why does the fate of this one man matter so much to you? There are times when one has to stand by what one believes, whatever the consequences. You cannot condemn a man you know in your heart to be innocent. It's a denial of all that you are. What he may be in his intrinsic soul is no concern of mine. That's the province of the gods. But I must judge him by his acts, by his statements, and by the necessities of government. If he insists on calling himself king of the Jews, he is guilty of the act of treason. If I tolerate treason, I tolerate revolution. This trial has nothing to do with us, what we feel for one another. But it does. Because it's not only he who is on trial, it is you and I. It is everything we stand for. We both know and without a doubt that this accused man is guiltless. Yes, but that's not answer enough where violence is threatened. That didn't concern you until your own future was threatened. Oh, I have dreamed of the house with the white pillars as much as you. But I always thought that if I were faced with a crisis, I could choose what was difficult, even fatal, because I loved you. You are not called upon to make judgment outside your home. I am not so fortunate. The man I am with you here, in my home, is not always the man I have to be in my courtroom. I live in the world. I am forced to compromise. But the beginning of all wisdom is compromise. It's the basis of all success in government. You judge life with the arbitrary intolerance of a child. I judge it with the intolerance of a woman who's loved a man and believed in him completely for a long time. And I cannot believe in you in one room and doubt you in another. I cannot respect you as my husband and question you as a judge. If it's true that you have indeed fought all these years for the principle of justice, then you should be ready to leave this palace with nothing for the sake of your principle. Are you daring to suggest that I should give up my career, abandon my position as governor? To save the life of an innocent man? Yes. You've never lived through revolution. 
I have. I've seen a city set on fire, buildings burned, and the people pillaged and tortured. Why, the lives of 400,000 people of yours and mine may be hanging in the balance at this very moment. But no right was ever defended without danger, anywhere, anytime. I think I am best able to judge what should and what should not be defended. It's unjust of you to use our marriage as a weapon to sway my judgment. Oh, my darling, it's only because I don't want you to be swayed by anything but your heart that I argue with you. I must go in. Hans, listen to What's me. What's the matter with you? You're trembling. I cannot help it. There must be no ghost, no guilt between us. Only absolute honesty can face the power of this strange man. What I can do for him under the law, I will do. Hans! Doctor, I've never seen you like this. I beg you to go inside and rest. You know that I would never condemn a man without doing everything I could on his behalf. This is your moment, pilot. It is upon you and upon you alone that the fate of this day depends. from the sixth hour there was darkness over the land unto the ninth hour. She not seen to go out. No, my lord. And yet she's gone. There's something most strange in the air, my lord. An unnatural darkness hangs over the city as far as the eye may see. Tis but the gathering of a storm. No doubt, my lord. And yet it is so still. How is it that in such a stillness the veil of the temple should be rent? I am not concerned with these superstitious maunderings. I would know only what's happened to my lady. It may be that she joined the procession that followed him to Golgotha. To Golgotha? Well, that's impossible. She shrinks from the very sight of pain. Maybe, Your Excellency. And yet, when they were leading him forth from the court, a sudden heaviness settled over the palace. I went to the roof in search of a stirring of wind. My lady was there before me. What? She was seated on the parapet, looking out over the city and weeping, as the women in the streets below were weeping. This diabolical trial. And then, as the procession disappeared from view, I heard her utter a cry. She rose abruptly and went below. Everything connected with this man leads to discord. If I might suggest, my Could lord... Could I have saved him? Could I have done anything but what I did? No, my lord. You offered him every chance to escape. In me that all along he wanted to die. See where that disturbance is. High priest, Annas is with him. Bid them come in. It's time they were silenced once and for all. Will receive you. What? By what right? You dare invade this palace without request. We have just learned of the inscription you have seen fit to have placed on the cross of this blasphemer pilot. Does it offend you? You have had written in three languages that he is king of the Jews. We demand that this lie, this insult be torn down. What respect can we command among our own people if this insult is permitted to remain? The respect you command is absurd at best. It is hollow and without meaning. I defend the principle of Rome, its law and its power. If this man that you describe is the imposter that you claim, then indeed is he guilty of the penalty for blasphemy and no more. It is only as he was indeed your king that he deserved the penalty of death. It is so he was judged and condemned. It is so he was crucified. Call this lettering an insult if you like. But it is for me the justification of the judgment that I have passed down. And as such, in the name of Rome, it will remain. May you be cursed for this thing, Pilate, until the end of your days. And may the power that is Rome's one day blow like dust 
through the gutters of Jerusalem. A necromancer is having his revenge on all of us, you see. Oh, spare us your dreary maledictions. You have had your way, you should be satisfied. We have defended the covenant. And betrayed your people. None of us have cause for gloating at this hour. There is no need for the four of us to keep on bickering here. We can do without each other's company for the next crisis or the next crucifixion. I wonder if it is over. We are all still here. The unholy alliance, just exactly as we were. Only he has gained his objective. What was his objective? To fulfill the prophecies by proving that he is the true Messiah. Had you failed to recognize that fact? What? Blasphemy! He will die before the stay is out on the hill of the skull, like thousands of others. Only the Messiah is above death. He is not like the others. I was afraid of him. I admitted it. I wanted to destroy him. But now, I wonder, was my desire for his death merely a deception? Was I and my fear merely a, a contributing factor to the, to the event? The event, do you see, that had to happen? He was crucified because you demanded it. The three of you. You left me no choice. We left you no choice. You knew that Annas and Caiaphas were powerless and that I was never really start an insurrection. You condemned him because he had to be condemned. You were in the grip of something stronger than you were, Pilate. I am warning you, who knows how deeply he may be versed in the arts of magic. Suppose he were to be taken down and revived and rise again. We should have no means of denying that he is what he pretends to be. He would have the whole nation behind him. If he were indeed the Messiah, why did he not save himself? If he were the son of God, he would have come down from the cross. My soldiers will remain at Golgotha until death is proved according to law. I will discuss it no further. That is not enough. Order your men, after he is taken down, to cut off his head, like I did the John the Baptist. That is the only way to ensure that death is indeed the end of everything. Lady Herodias. What are you doing here? Have Go back to your room at once. Have you forgotten? This is the day I stay awake to watch the triumph of the man you cannot kill. Go back to your room. You thought you'd killed him at Galilee, but he came back, John the prophet, and he always will. You'll kill him again and again all your life, and he'll still be there with that same smile on his lips. You poor, frightened puppet. Hold your bad tongue. Do you think you can kill him by nailing him to a cross? He's here in this room, behind every door. He's standing by every chair. He's inside us in our brain and our blood. He'll never leave us, never, till death and after. I won't do it, Rodius. I have heard enough. You thought you'd be a king, a great king. <laughs> but a prophet smiled at you, and all the glory of the Herod shrank to the whisper of rats in a rifle tomb. I'll let you go back to your apartments, I beg of you. I salute you, king of nothing. <laughs> that was unforgivable. You may sleep tonight in my room. At least you will be alone there. Is he dead yet? These are my apartments, King Herod. I ask you to leave them. Is he dead yet, I ask you? Is he dead, the king of the Jews? No death in this world can wipe out the smile on his lips. Not even the everlasting death. I shall go up to the roof and wait. You'd do better to hide in the cellars. I shall wait for you to bring me the head of this man. Wait if you are wise in your own interests. You will do. You must go and pray. Yes, pray, for we are all guilty, all of us. 
You may examine your own consciences. I am satisfied. I have done my duty. It is fitting that you who have sold out to Caesar should feel no shame. You gave me your word you would not leave the palace. I'm very angry with you. Why have you done this? I had to find out why he had to die. I told you again and again he was condemned because he would not save himself. He did not want to be saved. And what has he gained? He died a convicted felon no more. No. It is we who are condemned as felons. You said that we must live in the world. I think I've seen for the first time what the world is and what the world can do. The world can hang a body on a cross and drive nails through the quaking flesh and sit and jeer and play dice while a man's heart is torn out and tortured. It can dip a sponge in vinegar and thrust it between the bleeding lips made meaningless by pain. And that is all. That is the world's only answer to the riddle of what we are. I would have given anything to prevent you from seeing this. But I saw something else in the midst of this horror. Suddenly, he was beyond your soldiers with their gleaming breastplates and their spears. There was nothing they could do to him, nothing. He passed beyond the thunder and the wind into a... a silent, splendid, terrible and perfect. I watched over you and kept you near me. You're cold. You're like ice. Listen, what you've seen today is a vision of the world's brutality. But it has no more meaning to it than that. You must now try with all your courage and your trust in me to face the shock of this realistically. It will help you and pass from you sooner. Will the truth pass so quickly? I will tell you what the truth is. It is our life together. Do you understand? The walls of our house that shut out the anger and the pain. If I have wrestled with the intrigues and bitter, twisted wickedness of this city for so long. It is only that we should retire sooner and lead the life that we've dreamed of. Oh, so it is for me that you let him die. I did not let him die. It was a political necessity. Do you imagine that careers and politics are achieved without incidents? Many incidents like this. But I never wanted a career for you at such a cost. I would rather we had nothing and were nothing. My lord, well, a man named Joseph of Arimathea is here. He begs to see you. Do I know him? He says you do not, my lord. What does he want? He would not say more than that it is urgent. He's chosen an ill moment. My wife and I... No, oh, see him, I beg you. Show him in. The governor will see you now. Well. What reason have you to demand audience at this time? None. Except that I have nowhere else to appeal, Your Excellency. Appeal? For what? I cannot expect you to respect what I have to say, yet I must say it. I have come but now from Golgotha. I have stood and I have seen. And no matter what anger I may arouse, I must say to you that I believe you and we have done a monstrous thing. What? No. Let him say what is in his mind. Go on. Thank you, my lady. Your Excellency had reason, I am sure, to command that this man should die. You are Roman. I am a Jew. He faced you with silence. To me, he said, if you would be perfect, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Come then and follow me. I had neither the faith nor the courage then to give up so much. I slid away. Well? What do you wish? To make amends. I denied him once while he was alive. I would not deny him a second time. If I have given nothing to the poor till now, at least I can give to him a place to rest. This man will be dead by morning. It is ended. Is it, Your Excellency? I have no time for these meaningless questionings. Forgive me, I will be direct. I have a tomb, freshly hewn in the Garden of Gethsemane, which I have kept in readiness for myself. Let me take down the body of Jesus and bury it. Let me bury it well and with respect. He must hang on the cross until he is dead. He is dead already, Your Excellency. Not possible. He's been on the cross less than five hours. 
My lady, you were there. I saw you. You know that I speak the truth. Trocula, is this true? Yes, it is true. He died while I was on the hill. Give me the permission, pilot. It is so small an atonement. Very well. Take down the body. The seed that is laid properly in the tomb, in the stone roll before the door, and sealed. And let's have an end to this unlucky business. Manlius! At least you'll be guaranteed a decent burial. burial. Your Excellency. See that my horse is settled. I shall need a, a taper of wax and my big seal to set upon the door of the tomb. And I want six guards to watch the place until the Passover is finished. And let there be no rumor of resurrection to plague us further. Very well, my lord. I will see you outside. I will await you, my lord. Do not let this come between us. Fifteen years later, in the Roman year 798, Pontius Pilate was Roman governor of Cappadocia with headquarters in Tyana at the foot of the Taurus Mountains. This was many miles from Judea. But the shadow of that incident in Jerusalem had begun to spread far beyond the olive groves of Golgotha. Lord, these martyrs are hydra-headed. For each crucifixion we perform, there are ten ready to die tomorrow. It's endless. No, not endless. Just long and tedious. How many more? Only five, Your Excellency. When I have finished, bring the leaders from the prison. I wish to examine them. Yes, Your Excellency. Is my wife in the garden? No. She and Lucius Lepidus are in the next room. He wishes to bid you farewell before returning to Rome. We must hasten, then. I've kept them waiting an hour already. <laughs> Being his second wife has not been easy. He's greatly changed, I'm sure. Whenever he has to try these Christians, one can see it settling over him like a thundercloud. I dread these arrests. It means for two or three weeks he'll wander around in a terrible silence, down by the lake, under the pines. Gloom! It's like being married to the collected works of Euripides. <laughs> This is a terrible thing to say, Lucius. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe he wants these Christians to recant. He likes to see them crucified. He thinks that by sentencing them to death, that he can stamp out some obsession in himself. But he can't. Well, Lucius, are you leaving us after all? I'm afraid so, yes. We shall miss you. It's been like a breath of spring having you here. I must go and see if everything is in readiness for your departure. Forgive me. These Christians seem to be taking up a great deal of your time. Yes, but I think we can say we're past the flood. Mm. As long as we continue to be strong, they will soon lose their love of martyrdom. It's amazing how it spreads, though. The demonstrations are breaking out everywhere. Mm, the longer I live, the more I detest religious fanatics. We'd struggle to bring these barbarian countries the best the civilization has to offer, and along come these lunatics who deny reason and attack the very structure of rational living. And then, after finally sowing discord and sedition everywhere, march to their death, caterwauling their hymns, as though they were going to a festival. You know, in a way, I admire them. At least they have the courage of their convictions. 
Man has a unique birthright, the faculty of reason. To deny the existence of God is the one honest tribute one can pay him. Tell me, I've always wanted to ask you, if I dared, what really happened to Procula? I never knew. Without warning, with, without a word to anyone, she left everything. Her home, her family, her future, everything. This Nazarene must have had some extraordinary power to have appealed to her so strongly. It was not his strength, it was her weakness. A woman's indescribable desire for immolation. <laughs> well, whatever else you've lost, you certainly kept your reputation for legal rectitude. The incorruptible pilot. I put my trust in the law. The law is the only thing that survives without betrayal. Your litter is in the courtyard, Lucius. I can't bear to see you go. It's been such a relief for Pontius to have someone civilized to talk to. Goodbye, Lucius. Salute the Eternal City for me. I shall hold you to your promise to come and stay with me next year. We will, the gods be willing. I shall convey your respects to the Emperor. Most of the ringleaders have been called, Your Excellency. Do you know something, Manlius? It is tomorrow. Fifteen years ago, tomorrow. I know, my lord. The trial never ended, really. And yet it was the end of everything. Well, if it has to be, how many are there? Four, my lord. His Excellency, the Proconsul. You, I understand, are the confessed ringleaders who have joined the populace to defy the authority of Rome. You are also responsible for inciting the mob to desecrate the statue of Jupiter in the public square. Will you please answer my questions? Are you aware of the penalties incurred by these acts? I would ask you to answer individually. Yes. We knew the penalty. Yes. 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 I knew. I would... I would wish the prisoners taken back to their cells. I would talk to them, examine this one only. Yes, Your Excellency. You wish to be alone, my Yes. Lord? Procula, what are you doing here with this band of rebels? I was arrested. Your hair? It's been white for years. Fate certainly played a supreme jest, bringing us together here like this. I think it is very fitting that you should judge me. At least I'm certain of a fair trial. Why did you never send me word? There were no words. It seems that I was deceived in placing so high a value on the bond of marriage. I never loved you more than when I left you. I had to give up what I loved most in order to learn to love more. It was little enough beside Golgotha. And what precisely did he give up? He endured, no doubt, a few terrible hours on the cross, but he was sufficiently recovered to vacate the tomb two mornings later. He had risen. Don't tell me that you, of all people, support this incredible belief in his resurrection. It's no myth. You have the temerity to believe this incredible fabrication. He rose from the dead as he had promised, as all men may leave the prisons of their mortality. Do you not think that I examined enough prisoners not to know what happened? I've collected proofs for the last 15 years. They're in my files a thousandfold. And still the final proof always escapes you. Because the final proof isn't in him, but in you. And the truth that he stood All for... All you Christians babble about the truth. And yet in the courtroom, when I asked him the question, what is truth, he made no answer. What could he say? What could he have said that you would have accepted? I knew that you hated me, but I didn't realize how much. 
This is no time to settle our personal differences. There is the oath of allegiance. Read it. There is only one oath, and I have already taken it. You will take the oath of Rome, or I will force you to it. Force? You have none left to call on, and yet you go on trying Jesus and every man and woman who is brought before you. Will you stop this pernicious quibbling? It is you on trial, not I. This is reality. Not a question of model abstractions. You face the penalty of death by crucifixion. Yes, I know. You fool. You blind, drugged, self-deceiving fool. Can't you understand? There will be no Joseph to take you down. No tomb for you to recover in. You'll lie out there for two days until they break the joints in your legs and your heart bursts with the rush of blood. And they will throw your body into the common grave. There's no indignity in being buried with one's friends. Oh, I wish I could make you understand how, how unimportant the act of dying is. This is your whole life. And it hangs on one word. One word of denial. What else is worth dying or living for but to give witness to the truth? So this is the end that your pernicious faith has brought us to. You prefer to die. Death is your ultimate insolence, your final gesture of outrageous egotism. Well, die then! March to your death tomorrow, singing and praising the divine mercy while they batter the nails into your hands and feet. There's no need to describe it. I've seen it often enough. Well, what would I do? Resign my post to stop signing your death bond. You can try to understand if I can find words that you will understand. You ask me what I've found on my journey. I have found that in very truth, Jesus is the Son of God. But he's also the search. He's the thirst for freedom and the hunger for knowledge. He's an infinite number of resurrections over the deaths of outlived ideas. He moves in the restless mind and in the heart that cannot be satisfied. He's the storm of hope and the center of change. He's everything that is undaunted and passionate and undiscovered. He was no fireside philosopher that one could follow in ease and comfort. He offered only the unyielding struggle to become master of oneself and the servant of God. And so we search. We leave everything, our families, our home, our duty to one another, even our respect as human beings. And for what? To pay tribute to a man who performed only one genuine miracle before founding a religion on a miracle that never happened. No, but it did happen, and it goes on happening every day. There's a new world coming into being. I would go doubly happy if I knew that you would be a part of it. I prefer to stand by the world I know. I will send you the oath at dawn tomorrow. You will have 12 hours to reconsider your decision. <sighs> They're building the crosses. Don't think of me tomorrow. I, I, I shall be well armed and well protected. And I shall pray for you, my darling. Until my final breath, I shall pray that for you too, one day, you will be granted the miracle of sight. They refuse to sign the oath, my lord. They must learn. Or well, they must be taught to learn. It is the law. The law. What does it matter what they believe? Let them go, my lord. But it does matter. And they know it. It is all that matters. What you believe. Caesar or Christ. What you believe. She was everything I had, everything. 
life I ever cared for. What else is worth dying for but to give witness to the truth? To give witness to the truth. To give witness to the truth. <laughs> Marius, tell the execution to stop. Let them go. Let them go. I built my life on my belief in a Roman world and on my love for one woman. I don't know where I failed. This is your answer, the answer you never gave. I asked you what is truth, and you kept silent. This is the only answer you ever had. The crucifixion was done. But nothing was settled, nothing was ended. The agony goes on and has never been stilled. Roman soldiers drove the first nails through those hands and feet. Were they the crucifiers? No, not alone. Was it Rome? 1900 years ago, yes, in part. So in part was the emissary of Rome and a few men in high places who were jealous of their position and who were afraid. But not the people of Rome, who knew nothing about it, nor the people of Judea, many of whom loved and followed the one who had died on the cross. But this is not answer enough, for the crucifixion still goes on. Every hour of every day, the agony is reenacted. This is the season of reminder to look to ourselves. The guilt or innocence is in our own hearts. For anyone today as then who lives in fear, anyone who would secure his own well-being by sacrificing his principles, anyone who would still his conscience to his own gain, anyone who would by false dealing or false report cause hurt to another, Anyone who would throw the blame for Jesus' death on another man, another race, or another people is himself crucifying Christ again. Look to ourselves. It is only we, every hour of every day, who cause the agony to go on. You see, Mara, 
Everyone, not just every Christian, every one of us has a choice to make at some point in our lives. To follow Jesus, to take up his cross or not, to become a Christian, a follower of Christ or not. Just as Pilate's wife had this decision to make in what we just watched, to follow Christ, his teachings, the way he lived his life, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, or to go on as Pilate's wife and live the life of a Roman citizen. She had to choose between the life her heart now yearned for, the life Christ was calling her to, or the life of peace and safety, a life of physical wealth her mind directed her towards, a life that supported her physical body's well-being, a life that would certainly see her well into her old age safely, but more likely than not leave her empty, cold, and wanting inside. This woman had her choice in front of her, live for Christ or live for the world, take up his cross and follow him or set it down and return to the security of the life she had known. If she had been strictly logical, she would have chosen Pilate and the life he offered her. But the life of a Christian is not logical. It is a life lived in one's heart, where Jesus lives in us. So her choice was not made in logic, nor was it made in a place or mindset of this world. It was a choice made in Christ. She picked up his cross and followed him. She sacrificed safety and security, and you know the rest. What makes the Christian life the right answer, and not say the life of an agnostic or an atheist? Mary, everyone has their own path they must follow. I could no more follow or judge yours than you could mine. Nor could I understand the, the decisions you've made, or the choices you've chosen. Nor do I have any right to judge your motives. As your friend, all I can do is support you, and say this. None of us know the future. All we know is that we have to follow our paths to their conclusion. Even though we don't know where they lead or how we'll get to that unknown destination. All we can do is weather the storms together and help each other not to suffer as much when things get bad, when our trials and tribulations have finally made us ready and we arrive at our destinations, we can celebrate together. But for now, all we can do is support each other in what choices we make to the best of our abilities. It doesn't mean we can't disagree or argue, but at the end of the day, we're still friends. So Christian, agnostic, or atheist, at the end of the day, we're still here together, and that's what really counts. I do have another question, Buttonson, if it's all right. Ask as many as you like, Mayor. How did Pilate's wife know that Jesus wanted her to pick up his cross and follow him? After all, he was on his cross still. Interesting you should ask that, Mary. For instance, if we're at that crossroad of life, and we're deciding for Christ or against him. You might say we're going in one direction or another, or down one tunnel or another, or through one door or another. That's what the second film I'm going to show is about. Here, take a look. are an essential part of our lives, even more so than most of us realize. 
doors enable us to enter our homes, our schools, our churches, and our places of business. Without doors, we would be locked out of many comforts and joys of life. The ease and comfort of home, opportunities for worship in church, opportunities for work in the office. There are many kinds of doors, but all doors cannot be seen. There is a door to knowledge that we call study. There is a door to skill, which we have labeled practice. And a door to character, we call discipline. There is another door we cannot see, one which is just as real. It is the door to heaven. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. There is only one door to heaven. People would have us believe there are many doors to heaven. Some say the door to heaven is good works. Some say the door to heaven is good character. Others say the door to heaven is church membership. And then there are those who insist that self-righteousness is the door to heaven. Many are indifferent to the life beyond and pay no attention to heaven's door. Some procrastinate, meaning to enter heaven's door sometime, but they cannot be concerned with it now. To all such, God says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. But these doors lead only to destruction, for God says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Jesus said, there is none good but God. We can belong to many different churches, but unless we are members of the true church, which is the body of Christ, we are lost. It is not for us to trust in our own righteousness. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us. Christ is the only door to heaven. People have the idea that there is a special door to heaven for everyone. But how can we attribute such folly to God when we would not even attribute it to ourselves? None of us would build a home with special doors for each member of the family. We all use the same doors. And, of course, we know that the door which is large enough for the biggest one of the family is large enough for the smallest, too. So it is with heaven's door. It is large enough to permit the biggest as well as the smallest sinner to enter if he but come, seeking admittance in the name of Jesus. Some doors can be entered only after a specified entrance fee is paid. Heaven's door is open to all, without money and without price. But just because we pay nothing to enter does not mean that no price was paid. Oftentimes, great museums offer free admission to the public, in spite of the fact that they have been built at enormous cost. So it is with our entrance into heaven. It is free to us, but here is what it costs the Lord Jesus. Not silver and gold, nor precious stones, but his own precious blood. Some doors are open only certain hours of the day. Heaven's door is open at all times, night and day. But despite these facts, some will seek other ways to get into heaven. The Lord Jesus has this to say of them, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Doors enable us to seek shelter from the storms of life. And so, the door to heaven enables us to find shelter from the storm of God's wrath. It makes all the difference in the world which side of the door we're on, the inside or the outside. 
those who have chosen to enter heaven's door can never come under the wrath of God. But those who remain outside the door are already under the wrath of God and must suffer the full force of the storm when it breaks. Which side of the door are you on? Most doors permit us to carry anything through them as we enter. But heaven's door is very narrow and will permit us to take nothing with us. No one can carry his sin into heaven. Those who will not forsake their sin cannot enter heaven's door. But those who will allow the Lord Jesus to wash their sin away will be able to pass through heaven's door. No one can enter heaven with a heart of unbelief. Only a heart that believes on the Lord Jesus will have entrance there. Men cannot take their riches with them. At heaven's door, we part with all earthly gain. Earthly fame, too, must be forsaken at heaven's door. Even unsaved friends and loved ones must be left behind unless they can be won to the Savior before it's too late. But there are many things we shall leave behind gladly. At heaven's door we part with sorrow forevermore. We leave all suffering behind. All disappointment, too, will be gone forever. All worry will be left behind. There is only one thing we can take with us through that door, those whom we have led to the Savior. What a joy it would be to take into the Savior's presence many whom we have won to him. Now, during the day of grace, the door of heaven is open wide, and the Savior's invitation to all is, Come, enter in. Will you not answer that call? Will you not accept the Lord Jesus today and thereby become one of those who can enter heaven's door? Do not delay, my friend, for someday that door will close by God himself and no power on earth will be able to open it. Then you will seek in vain to enter. Then you will have only vain regrets because you did not enter while you could. But praise be to God for his mercy toward the children of men Heaven's door is still wide open. Won't you enter while you may? Won't you heed the words of the Lord Jesus when he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Won't you accept him as your savior and there take your place among those who will someday pass through heaven's door into the beautiful city of gold? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb, and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, 
he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Jesus also went on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Finally, from Scripture, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pilate's wife took up Jesus' cross and followed him. She did this because she felt his calling in her heart. She believed in him. Pilate's wife believed in Jesus, just as the thief crucified next to Jesus believed in our Savior when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know what Jesus said to the thief because of his belief? Today you will be with me in paradise. That's all it took, the thief's belief, and then his confession of that belief with his mouth and then he was saved forever. Does the confession, telling Jesus, is it something that has to be done in front of people, or can we do it by ourselves, Bunsen? When we go to Jesus for our salvation, it doesn't matter if we do it in a church, when we get the altar call, or if we do it with a friend, or if we do it at home when we hear a call on television. It doesn't really matter when or how we come to Jesus. All that matters is that when we go to Jesus, we go to him honestly, truly, and from our hearts, because Jesus knows our hearts. But the thief, he, he was next to Jesus physically and talked to him. Pilate's wife, she was someone of importance in the world she lived in. Can just anyone, anyone at all, can just anyone be saved? God doesn't lie, Mary. Romans 10.13 says, Any who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Any means any, Mary. God takes all comers, and from all walks of life, from any age group, from any nation or ethnicity or gender. Any who call on his name from their heart will be saved. How? How d How does one go about doing something like that? I haven't been in the church since I was a kid, Benson. It's been just as long since I last prayed. I'm not sure I even know how anymore. It doesn't matter that you haven't been to a church in a while. It doesn't even matter that you and God haven't talked in some time. All that matters is that you're willing to talk now. After all, Jesus said it himself, the healthy have no need of a physician, it's those of us who need help, who need to be healed, it's we who need God's grace, his unmerited favor at work in our lives, he's the doctor who cures all, all you have to do is pray from the heart, Mary, that's all he expects you to do. I'm not sure how, I don't think I know the words. Would you like me to pray with you, Mary? I'd appreciate it, Bunsen. I don't think I can do this on my own. Mary, just repeat after me. Jesus, I come to you, a sinner. Jesus, I come to you, a sinner. I'm lost, Jesus, and I don't want to be lost anymore. I'm lost, Jesus, and I don't want to be lost anymore. I know that you've been calling me. I know that you've been calling me. 
I feel your presence tugging at my heart. I feel your presence tugging at my heart. I'm ready now. I'm ready to receive you into my heart. I'm ready now. I'm ready to receive you into my heart. I'm ready to receive you into my life. I believe in you, Jesus. I'm ready to receive you into my life. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you came to the earth, took a body, took my sin upon your body at Calvary's cross. I believe that you came to earth, took a body, took my sin upon your body at Calvary's cross. And as your holy, incorruptible blood flowed down that cross, my sins were washed clean. And as your holy, incorruptible blood flowed down that cross, my sins were washed clean. Once and for all, forgotten, forgiven, forever. Once and for all, forgotten, forgiven, forever. Jesus, I accept you this day and your sacrifice done on my behalf. Jesus, I accept you this day and your sacrifice done on my behalf. Jesus, come into my heart. In your holy name I pray this, Jesus. Amen. Jesus, come into my heart. In your holy name I pray this. Amen. I feel a warm glow of peace inside my chest once and as if an emptiness that was in me has now been removed not removed, filled, filled with something glorious and heavenly. Not something, someone there. The presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the love God has for you, Mary. Thank you, Bunsen, for introducing me to Jesus. I don't know what to say or how I can ever thank you. Words just, they don't seem to be anywhere near enough. You don't need to thank me, Mary. I'm only the messenger. Thank the man who sent me. It's his message after all, isn't it? His message to everyone, everywhere. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should be saved and inherit eternity with him. Now, Mary, you will. You will. It's getting late, but I'd hate to go just now. It would seem a shame to leave when I feel we should be celebrating at least a little. Somehow, some way. Well, I do have a few things with me, Mary. Some juice, a little bread, and some crackers. I know they aren't much, but in a way, perhaps I think they are kinda appropriate to the occasion. I'd be honored if you'd break bread with me, Mary, and let me celebrate your entry into the family of Christ. The honor is mine, Benson. All right, Mary. Let me just get my backpack and get the things I mentioned, and we'll have ourselves a little feast. While you're doing that, I'll step out to the ladies' room. said something about working on a passenger line recently. I wonder if, could it be possible if one of those ships came from? It could be. Stranger things have happened. Well, it can't hurt to check. Computer, track down the last known location of Commander Lionel Swirler. When found, open the communications link and alert me immediately. 